Great. So hello, everyone, and thanks for those who joined us early. Um, I am Jared Sanchez, a policy advocate at the California Bicycle Coalition, also known as CalBike, which is a uh, statewide policy ad advocacy organization in the state of California. Um, welcome to our great panel we're having today on decriminalizing um, jaywalking. We have um, several experts, advocates, and um, delegates, um, elected officials, and so on, who will speak to their efforts in decriminalizing jaywalking in their location um, with the hope of joining us all together here to really spur more efforts across the country um, to decriminalize jaywalking and end pretextual policing of all kind um, for folks that you care about in your community and um, issues you're working on. So. I um, just wanted to welcome everyone and want to introduce our moderators and panelists. Um, to first um, start off, I will introduce the, the moderators. Um, first is uh, Dr. Charles Brown, a renowned pedestrian safety expert. He serves as a senior researcher with the Alan M. Voorhees Transportation Center and is an adjunct professor at the Edward Bluestein School of Planning and Public Policy both at Rutgers University, and he's also the founder of Equitable Cities. Thanks, Charles, for being with us. Uh, the other moderator for today's event is John Yi, who is the executive director of Los Angeles Walks. Um, before I pass it over to Charles to give us a, a better and proper framing for today's events, um, I briefly just want to mention some of the great panelists we have for today's event. Um, first, starting off with Angie Schmidt, um, who is a longtime national, who was a longtime national editor at Streets Blog. She's also the founder and principal at 3MPH Planning Consulting, uh, a firm focused on pedestrian safety. And she is the recent author of the book, uh, Right of Way, Race and Class and the Silent Crisis of Pedestrian Deaths in America. Thanks, Angie, for being here. Um, and next panelist is uh, Kato Horegi, who is the co-executive director at California Walks, who's also helping uh, John and myself lead the California efforts in California. So thanks, Kato, for being with us. Um, next panelist is Michael Kelly, who is the policy director at Bike Walk Kansas City, also known as Bike Walk KC, who is working on these efforts at a local level. Thank you, Michael, for being with us. And lastly, we'll have, and you'll see on the screen, is Delegate Patrick Hope. Patrick Hope is a member of the Virginia General Assembly as a delegate from the 47th District of the Commonwealth of Virginia, who's led some great efforts um, for uh, decriminalizing jaywalking at the state level in Virginia. So. Thank you all for being here and I'll pass it over to you now, Charles, to, to carry us on. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here with us today. Again, my name is Charles T. Brown and I'm founding principal of Equitable Cities. I would also like to invite you again to today's national discussion on decriminalizing jaywalking. As one of the nation's leading experts on pedestrian and bicycle safety, I think it is time for states and cities to consider decriminalizing jaywalking or eliminating the infraction altogether. And here are nine reasons why. First, jaywalking is a made up thing by auto companies to deflect blame when drivers hit pedestrians. Secondly, the concept of jaywalking encourages drivers to be aggressive toward pedestrians and for third parties to ignore or excuse pedestrian deaths. Thirdly, our streets are not designed to make walking safe or convenient. Fourthly, pedestrians are almost as likely to be struck and killed at an intersection as mid-block. Fifth, when pedestrians jaywalk, they're often behaving rationally. Six, jaywalking laws are not enforced fairly. Seven, jaywalking stops are frequently explosive. Eight, the focus on jaywalking reflects the lower political status of those who walk, not the societal, societal harm of the activity. And then lastly, 
the safest countries globally allow jaywalking. There are several states and cities actively in pursuit of decriminalizing jaywalking in the country at the moment. They include the states of Virginia, California, Texas, and the city of Kansas City, Missouri. We really appreciate those working hard throughout the country to address this issue. Now I'd like to turn things over to my co-moderator, John. John. Thank you, Dr. Brown. I think uh, you really helped sort of frame that for us, right? The issues that, uh, that bring us to the table here today. And I just wanted to highlight one thing you said about one of the reasons is, you know, we're acting rationally. These are rational decisions that we're making. And so the idea that someone should be penalized, the indignity that comes with it for being taking, making rational decisions and navigating your own community, I think really um, shows why a discussion like this is important. So thank you. So yeah, let's just open it right up. We're going to go right into our opening comments from our panelists. So uh, I'm going to ask a question. Uh, it's a very broad question, but we'll go around uh, which each panelist and we'll answer them. And then afterwards, we'll have a sort of a moderated conversation. But at the end, for all the participants, we're going to spend about 10 minutes from questions, or a little more if we have more time, from questions from the audience. So if you have any questions, feel free to already stop populating the document, I'm not the document, the Q&A box, or put it in the chat. We'll keep a record. So. Um, right. John, okay. yes. John, this is Caro. Uh, someone wrote uh, that maybe we're having an IT issue because they have a dark screen and there are no speakers showing on their monitor. I believe Jared was responding to them, but I, I don't know what that means. I don't know if that means that maybe we haven't started for everybody. Yeah. Let me oh, okay. Someone else is saying that they're good. Okay. <laughs> Other people are saying that they're fine. So maybe it's just this person. Okay. And Jared, if you if I know I saw that you were messaging them, if you could try to resolve that. Thank you so much. Okay. I'll stop now. <laughs> Thank you for the active response. You know, that's how you navigate through the Zoom world. So I appreciate it, everyone. And Sandy, I hope you and Jared can figure it out. So uh, we'll, we'll move forward. And Sandy, you'll join us soon, I'm sure. So yeah, let's just begin with opening comments. We'll do a round robin, as I shared. Um, and so the question is, why is this issue important to you? Why is this issue important to you? So we're a small group, so I'll let y'all uh, sort of popcorn if anyone wants to take the first down. Uh, I guess I'll start off. Um, so back when I was reporting every so often, um, there would come, a situation would come up where um, like, for example, I remember on the front page of the New York Post, there was a picture of like an elderly Asian man who was bleeding from his face, being loaded into uh, the back of a police car. And um, this is a gentleman, he was stopped by police in New York and um, a little bit confused about why he was being stopped and ended up having this sort of brutal arrest and then it being on the front page of the paper. And I, that, that sort of happens over and over again. We saw it twice. I saw the same thing happen twice in Austin, Texas. Um, we, we've seen it in Sacramento. There was a very bad case in Sacramento. Um, so over and over again, there's sort of been this repeating pattern. And I think um, when people get stopped for jaywalking, they're angry about it because it is such a trivial sort of violation. It's so harmless. But then a lot of police, um, for a lot of police, that kind of reaction is unacceptable. So it gets escalated very quickly. Um, and oftentimes, you know, ends very badly for the people who are involved. And it's also can be very embarrassing for the cities and the police departments involved. Like, um, so that's one reason I got interested in it. Uh, this is Patrick Hope. I, I'll I'll go next, uh, and I'll describe what our sort of our thought process was in in Virginia. Uh, we passed a law that went into a, has already gone into effect on March the first, and this was part of our effort under police reform and criminal justice reform. You know, late in the summer, we had civil unrest in many cities related to the murder of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, and and you know, people being pulled over or stopped. And, and, as, and, and as was stated, they can escalate really quickly and in many cases, in most cases, unnecessarily. And we all know a disproportionate number of people that are cited for traffic and pedestrian stops tend to be people of color. Um, I, I probably jaywalk every day of, of my life and I've never been cited for it. So what we did in Virginia is we looked at the entire traffic co code, 
with the singular goal to eliminate some of these unnecessary interactions with law enforcement. And, and I hope that this exercise serves as a model for other states. So we looked at jaywalking, we looked at dangling objects that are hanging in your rear view mirror, tinted windows, a, a single broken taillight or brake light. Uh, a big one that's related to jaywalking is odor of marijuana. A lot of cases we'll see that someone stopped for jaywalking and, and law enforcement will say, I smell marijuana on you. And, and that's an excuse to search your person or your belongings. And the reality is, is that police really don't care about these violations. I have to tell you, when this bill was, was introduced during our special session, law enforcement did not testify in opposition to this bill because the things that we identified, they really don't care about, but they do serve as an excuse to pull someone over and ask questions and perhaps search their vehicle for a traffic infraction or their person or, or their belongings. And so that was our singular purpose for, for bringing the law. And, and that's what I hope becomes a model for, for other states and jurisdictions to emulate. So uh, this is Michael Kelly and I can go next. Um, so kind of uh, going off of um, Delegate Hope's um, approach, I think what was really the impetus in Kansas City was um, following the protest over the murder of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, as well as um, some of the local cases here involving um, individuals such as Cameron Lamb and Breonna Hill. Um, the mayor here, Mayor Quentin Lucas, um, said that he wanted to review the uh, full municipal code and see if there were instances where we could identify places to decriminalize activities. So at, at first, it wasn't just limited to uh, transportation or housing or something else. It was supposed to be a very broad stroke. Mike Wall Casey looked at that and, and we said, you know, there's an opportunity here for us to look at ways to decriminalize mobility. And so we began to look through the municipal code and, and we were basing our own review on answering two questions. First, are the, the laws that we're looking at, are they actually helping to make um, pedestrians, cyclists, vulnerable road users safer? And if the answer is no, then the second question was, is there a chance that the way that the law is currently written could lead to over-policing? And if the answer to that was yes, then we kind of flagged that and set it aside and, and said we would come back and look a little bit closer. We ultimately identified three laws. Um, jaywalking is one of them, but we also identified um, bicycle inspection. So police in Kansas City are allowed to arbitrarily stop someone if they believe a bike is in a state of disrepair and inspect it. But also there is a dirty wheels statute on our books here. So you can effectively be in violation of the municipal code if there's trash, debris, mud, gunk on your wheels. Um, <laughs> hard to enforce in, in, on a sunny day like this, but especially after some of the recent weather we've had, absolutely impossible. So um, we have been working to uh, try to get this move forward. And our hope is that we will not only be able to get this adopted and, and get all three of these struck from the municipal code, but that it can be kind of a model for other communities across our region. Um, okay, so here in California, um, I'm with California Walks. Um, since 2015, I've been participating in one of our main programs, which is our statewide trainings, where we actually never have used, very intentionally, don't use the word jaywalking. Because according to the California Vehicle Code, it's a very specific definition. And what we've learned from being across the state in all types of different communities is that that law is very confusing. And what we've even seen is that people think they can't cross in particular places because it's an unmarked crosswalk. People think that they can only cross at corners that are marked. And so for us, this has been an issue that's just really been on our radar for years. And then I wanna say maybe November, December, Jared uh, from Cal Bike. Um, you know, approached me and approached other partners such as LA, LA Walks 
about um, introducing this at a state at, at a state level through the state legislature. And so because the definition of jaywalking is so, again, confusing and even cops don't understand it because um, in 2017, I'm looking at my notes in 2017, there was a man named Nandi Kane Jr. who was beaten by Sacramento police um, for and was stopped initially for jaywalking, but they actually weren't jaywalking. They were crossing exactly where they were supposed to cross. It was just that it was an unmarked crosswalk. So for us, we're very excited. We were very excited to join in to in this effort for two reasons. Absolutely, because it's become an issue about race, which I know is what, what we're going to be discussing further in, in the panel. And also because people don't really know where they can legally walk. And, and that's, I believe it's a problem. Great, thank you all for your amazing responses. I think we have such a variety from like how trivial this law is, but yet how consequential it is to, this is part of a national, uh, recognizing you know the national racial, reckon, racial reckoning that's going on right now to just more clarity for our pedestrians about what the laws of the road are. So I think these are some great examples. So with that, uh, I just wanna say, Lisa, I see your question. So keep the, keep the questions coming in. Uh, we're not gonna close any of this. We'll make sure we address these questions uh, at the end when we go to participants. So with that, I'm gonna pass this to my colleague, uh, Dr. Brown. Yeah, so what we're gonna do now is, um, we're gonna ask you a series of questions based upon a number of topics, raising from, going from safety to targeting, to restorative justice, to infrastructure, and then lastly, enforcement. So one of the earliest comments we've gotten already is that if you're not breaking the law, then you should have nothing to fear. Uh, if you are detained by the police. And so in the context of jaywalking, how do we balance our attempts to decriminalize jaywalking with the need to ensure that all pedestrians, motorists, and bicyclists are safe on our roadways? So how do you balance this need for decriminalization with the collective call for safety? Um, if it's all right, I can I can hop in on this. Go one. ahead, Michael. Sure. So, I think it, it deals a, a a lot with access. So, um, the the idea with our transportation system, kind of in general, is that you you need to be able to go from point A to point B to be able to access everything from job to food to medical services, and we we don't have a transportation system that allows for that balance as it relates to all road users. If you're a driver, sure, you can get in your car and get somewhere as quickly as you want in most instances with no issue. But if you're someone who's walking, I now have to plan, okay, am I gonna have to cross this street or this street? Well, this one's kind of dangerous. And so the idea of, of safety is, is really a, a question of who we're working to provide access for. Um, everyone deserves to be able to safely get from one place to another. But if we're not actually working to make that possible, then additional barriers that we put up, including things like jaywalking laws, don't actually work to create that balance and to create that level playing field for everyone to be able to use. Yeah, um, I'll jump in here for... Um... So we're actually not getting very good safety outcomes for pedestrians right now. We've had about a 50% increase in pedestrian deaths in the United States over the past 10 years. And um, the, there was sort of a, a paradigm shift going on in, in the way we think about traffic safety. This is sort of an international movement that's just kind of coming to the United States. But um, to sort of switch from, you know, in the past when someone was hurt or killed in traffic, we sort of, um, our, our, our cultural habit was to blame an individual. Somebody did something wrong. But um, there, there's a new sort of concept called safe system. And um, it, it comes from Europe, um, from some of the countries that have the safest uh, roads in the, in the world. 
And the idea is not that, because people make mistakes. Uh, you know, we can't design a system where we wouldn't design, for example, um, a safety system inside a workplace where if, if one person makes an error, they can potentially die. People make errors. So we need to, we, we need to sort of shift responsibility a little bit from individuals to system designers. Um, and that, that includes thinking about, um, thinking about what is the broader environment we're putting pedestrians in. And right now it's not a very safe one. I mean, I, and I would just add to that, uh, you know, I made a confession uh, during my opening statement that I jaywalk every single day. And I think we should disassociate jaywalking with unsafe behavior. I, I live in Arlington County. Arlington County is a very urbanized, it's a well-planned community. And there's a lot of emphasis and focus on trying to make it more pedestrian friendly. But we have a lot of cars on the road and it's just for pedestrians and bikers, we're trying to make them as safe as possible. And when you have people congregating cars, vehicles congregating at a four way stop or an intersection, in many cases, and probably most cases, that's not the safest place to park when to cross when there's a lot of uh, cars going back and forth. In many cases, it's safer to cross midway before mid street before the intersection. And that's why I said I do it all the time. And so people people ask me after this law was passed, do 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 you think that people are now are going to jaywalk now more than ever before? And my answer to that is probably not. I don't think people jaywalk because uh, they're afraid of getting cited. At least in my case, it's not it's not the case. People jaywalk because it's safer to cross the street. And, and that way. So I think we got to disassociate this jaywalking with being a crime and being unsafe because it actually is safer in, mo in many cases to jaywalk. And if you get into people's mind, you talk about rational uh, thinking, that's why they jaywalk is because it's safer to do so. And I'll just add uh, one more thing to that. Um, I agree with everything that the rest of the panelists have shared. And I'll just say that I think that we've been prioritizing drivers for too long. And I think that that kind of goes with what Angie was talking about. Um, we need to really change from the individual sort of the individual blaming to how, what is the entire setup of a street and who is benefiting more from the use of these streets. And, especially here, I'm, I'm based in Southern California. Um, I would say, especially here, it's, it's this very much a car culture. Um, and, and that's part of why, and you said it too, that's something that we need to, to really change to make sure that everyone can be safe so that the streets can be truly used for everybody. Now, there are many who would say um, it's conspiracy talk when you discuss, uh, in particular, you, uh, Delegate Hope, you, you stated that, um, as well as uh, Angie, that jaywalking is used as a pretext. Um, many would say, is there any data to support that, number one? But the important question here for you all is, are they deliberately targeting people particularly people of color and low-income people as it relates to this jaywalking law? And in answering, perhaps you could move aside the, the advert deliberately. Are they targeting people of color and low-income people as it relates to the jaywalking law? Well, I mean, I'll go ahead and start. And, and so the evidence that, that, that we saw and, and heard, and we talked you know, to a lot of defense attorneys and a lot of individuals, and, and, I, didn't, and, I, and I said earlier, I've never been stopped for, for jaywalking, but a disproportion of people that wind up in traffic court or even in our lower courts, because not only does the jaywalking end up in a citation for jaywalking, there's also maybe, a, as I said earlier, uh, and they smell odor of marijuana, which, as you know, is a very subjective test and in many cases may be made up, probably is made up and because, but we only know the cases that they find and end up going to get prosecuted and going to court 
tend to be a disproportion of people of color. And so either you believe that people of color are smoking marijuana at a higher rate than whites, which is not true, but those tend to be the people that wind up in court. So we know we have clear evidence that shows that it's people of color that are being targeted for these, for these offenses. And again, this is not a serious crime that we're talking about here. What tends to happen is you're seeing people crossing the street and a law enforcement officer wants an excuse to stop them and ask them questions and maybe to search their belongings or their person. And that's what we see a disproportionate share of. And again, and I don't, and I don't, not trying to wiggle our way out of this, we're being very direct of what we're trying to do in Virginia. We're trying to, to eliminate some of these unnecessary stops against people of color. That was the goal. And that's just being smart policing. It's our police reform of what we're trying to do. And, and this is an effort to do that. Yeah, um, I would add, so um, I, I researched this a little bit for my book and I have like a chapter about it. And in, in almost every case, this has been looked at. The, um, it's been wildly disproportionate. It's, um, and primarily it's young, young men, young black and brown men. So, the, the, and the most interesting study in my opinion, is this one out of Jacksonville, Florida that ProPublica did. They found that um, black people were three times more likely to be cited for jaywalking than white people. And if they lived in the poorest neighborhoods, they were six times more likely. So there's been studies, Seattle, um, Chicago, New York, all, they, all similar findings. Um, and uh, the way, one thing that's interesting, really interesting about the, the study is they said that um, in Florida, there's 28 different infractions that count as jaywalking. So it's not just not crossing in a marked crosswalk. You can be cited, um, what the, what the um, authors of the report said was you could be pretty much anyone walking any distance is gonna run afoul of one of these laws. And they even recorded police in certain locations that were jaywalking. So uh, police have very wide discretion over who they can stop. And they're not stopping the kind of business, uh, white businessmen in suits that you know may, might put in a call to their manager. They're sort of citing people who are powerless or maybe who they um, have suspicions about that, again, go back to racism. And if I can just add a few statistics uh, from California, I'll also put in in the chat um, a link where we're storing a lot of information via CalBikes uh, domain. So in, in California, Black Californians in San Diego are 4.3 times more likely to be cited for jaywalking than white residents. In LA by LAPD, it's 3.7 times higher. In Long Beach, it's 3.4 times higher. And in Sacramento, Black Californians are cited for jaywalking five times more than the general population. So again, I'm going to, um, I'm going to add those stats here in the chat, or at least the site where you can find the stats, because we are definitely not making this up and um, part of what's really, I don't know, just horrible is that in some of these stops, we're having cases in California where black men are being killed for jaywalking. That was the pretext and um, I have here a couple of those people's names. I don't know if now's the time to share, but I just wanted to say that, that this is very much happening and this is why we're doing this and this really needs to end. So, I'll, so I'm a little bit uh, unique from the other folks on the panel in that Kansas City, um, it is very difficult to be able to get access to data in, in Kansas City because um, Kansas City locally does not have control of our police department. We are one of the largest uh, communities in the country where our police department is not controlled by our elected officials at City Hall. It's actually controlled by a board of police commissioners, largely appointed by um, folks in Jefferson City. And so the reason why that makes it harder for us is that um, we have to we have to work with city staff and sometimes elected officials here to request the data that would help us to 
um, paint a similar picture as what we see in Virginia, in California, and elsewhere. And so um, what, what we've had to rely on in the absence of that are the testimony of other folks. Um, it, I think uh, Delegate Hope was making a very good point about uh, relying on the word of, of defense uh, attorneys because those are often the folks who are having to literally go to bat and go to court for these folks to get them out of something as simple as stepping one foot outside of a crosswalk or crossing at a place where the crosswalk was worn down from paint and or from water and things of that nature and so it's it's that the targeting that we know is happening is is still happening based on what we're hearing from criminal defense attorneys but also the way that we need to think about it is that going back to the idea of safety, if we felt that jaywalking laws were actually working to make people safe, then we would know that it would be leading to a corresponding decrease in crashes. And everyone on this panel knows that that unfortunately has not been the case. Thank you. That was, that was excellent. Now, I'm not opposed to law enforcement, right? I think law enforcement has its place. But what is law enforcement's place as we aim towards increasing pedestrian and bicycle safety throughout the US? What role should law enforcement play in the regulation of pedestrian and bicycle behavior or not? Let's start with you, Delegate Hope. What are your thoughts? Well, I mean, I think this is a question that I think, I hope every state is having this conversation about what is the future. And, and of course, it's not just pedestrian and bike safety, it's also traffic enforcement as well, too. We're having the conversation of, you know, should should law enforcement be involved in enforcing traffic violations? And 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 should we should we maybe hire a different force that's unarmed, uh, that's not law enforcement to enforce traffic laws? It could be through cameras, it could be other different means that we could we could use. And those conversations, I hope, are going on in every state and every locality in this country. So it's a really good question. From us, I could just tell you what we did. We looked at the laws and the traffic infractions where we thought were the most serious and kept those as crimes. But things that we did not think that were serious, things that we felt were secondary offenses or things that we felt that led themselves to a pretext that led to someone just saying that it's an excuse to stop someone or to pull someone over or to search a person, those subjective tests we turned in secondary. I mean, if you're speeding, you're speeding. And that's a pretty obvious thing to do. And you can pull someone over for that. But tinted windows, the odor of marijuana, a dangling top, your a rosary beads that are hanging over your rear view mirror is obstructing your vision. That's all very subjective and should not be used as an excuse to stop someone. And so again, I hope all these conversations are going on. And, and you know, this is part of our effort to reform our law enforcement, to inform our police, because as stated many times, these infractions are not very serious and too frequently they escalate into something that becomes serious when they don't have to. Let's go to you, Michael. And in KC, then go to California, then Angie. Sure. So, I think with regards to enforcement, um, we we need to recognize that it should play a much smaller role than what it has up to this point. I think that um, we have kind of looked at this as a um, as a means of just something else to kind of hand off to the police in some instances when we realize um, more and more through research like Charles and, and Angie are doing that a lot of it is going to depend on how we're building our cities, not necessarily how we're regulating them. And so if we're serious about wanting to use enforcement effectively, then we need to understand that it's probably going to play a much smaller role than what we currently envision. And that is going to differ a great deal from a place like Kansas City to a, a state like Virginia, but we don't do ourselves any favors by acting like the status quo is working because it clearly isn't. 
So here in, here in California, I do think a lot of um, different organizations and I've even heard in terms of nonprofits and I've even heard of like different DOTs starting to have those conversations internally, like what is the role of enforcement in, in, in traffic, right? Um, and I would say that here at California Walks, um, um, uh, my organization, we've decided to drop that E, that enforcement period. We're not interested in continuing to move forward with, let's say countermeasures, solutions for safe streets that include enforcement or any type of policing in that way. And so I could say that about us. And what we are looking into is looking into hosting probably round tables. We, we've hosted a series of round tables kind of like every year regionally. For example, last year or two years ago, I can't remember, or actually still now, we're doing a emerging transportation technology. And I think now, right, because that was kind of a hot topic, still is before COVID. And now I think the really important topic of what we all need to get on the same, same page about and to all understand how this affects all of California at a regional level, now I think we have to have those conversations. And so I will say that California Walks is very much interested in leading and or supporting those conversations. So anyone from California, um, follow up with me if you're interested in, in doing that too, because I see that very much being a, a part of our role. And I can't say that I think we have the answer, um, and I, I think that collectively we can figure that out. Thank you. Dado, do you mind sharing your email in the chat box for anyone interested? Thank you. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, I don't know that I have a lot to add to that, I, but we do see much more serious infractions like um, uh, hit and runs that just go totally uninvestigated um, in our cities. And it's just, I think, uh, it's a poor use of police resources. It's, um, you know, who wants police off, you know, these open rape cases to be hassling black teenagers, you know, churches trying to walk and take care of their daily activities. So um, that, I, yeah, I agree that there's a whole discussion to be had. Thank you. Michael, you touched on something for a second there. You talk about the importance of, you know, building our cities in an equitable and inclusive way. I want to ask each of you, what role does infrastructure or street design um, play in people's need to jaywalk or not? So what's this connection um, to the lack of or the need for additional infrastructure investments in these cities? Um, I can start on this and, and I can speak to this a little bit from a um, personal perspective. So if I step outside of my house, there are no sidewalks on my street. Um, and, and unfortunately in um, much of the, the council district where I'm in, there are several neighborhoods where there aren't sidewalks on our streets. And so it's it's not a matter of, um, I'm, I'm saying this to just make a, make a, a controversial statement I'm saying it because that's the that's the life that I live like I, I have two small children and I want them to be able to grow up in a place where they have the same opportunities as everyone else and that can't happen if we not only don't invest in the infrastructure that allows them to thrive but punish them for not using that non-existent infrastructure and so when we think about the idea of infrastructure and the role that it plays in equity, we, we need to be thinking about intentionally, not just how we're working to kind of stop the harm, but how we can work to kind of reverse and repair the harm that we have historically done um, to these communities by depriving them of these key resources, like something as simple as a sidewalk. Yeah, I mean, I, I would certainly agree with what Michael said. I mean, this is going to take a, a coordinated, deliberate uh, funding effort in our infrastructure. And, you know, probably 20, 30 years ago, the transportation budget was all about paving roads, expanding bridge highways and bridges and things like that. Then suddenly we started talking about transit and everyone started buying into transit and doing more in transit. 
And now we're slowly starting to talk about infrastructure when it comes to pedestrians and bike trails and things like that. And I would like to see in Virginia us to have a dedicated funding stream in our entire transportation budget that goes towards trails, that goes towards a infrastructure that localities can apply for and have that part of their communities. But it's gonna take a dedicated effort, dedicated funding stream to go towards, have your funding for roads, have your funding for transit, but also have some funding for, for infrastructure, for trails, for bikes and pedestrians crossing. Yeah, um, if I could jump in, I, I, we're hopefully with this new administration, I know that they have proposed some additional funding for biking and walking. I don't think it's enough to make the sidewalk network complete in places like Metro Kansas City, but um, at least are trying to um, sort of shift the focus a little bit. But one thing I want to point out is, that I think is really unjust about this issue is um, there's this very, there's this regulatory document called the Manual for Uniform Traffic Control Devices. And I'm working on a campaign about that, but basically it's the engineering manual that traffic engineers across the country use. And it, it's a federal regulation, so it's a law. And um, in this, it's, so it's this very obscure document, hardly anyone knows about it, but in it, it says that Engineers are not supposed to add crosswalks with a traffic signal, which is a lot of people say the safest place to cross unless almost 100 pedestrians are crossing at the location per hour or um, it used to say five people were struck there in a single year. The latest revision that isn't isn't final yet says they've changed it. They've made it a little bit better. Now four people over five years have to be struck for a crosswalk with a traffic signal to be warranted. And the, the reason for that is the engineering profession has been so focused on moving cars. They don't want to delay drivers. So what, what they've done is they've traded the safety of people who walk for the convenience of people who drive. And so we're, I, well, at the same time, we're penalizing people for not crossing in crosswalks. We have a federal regulation that makes it illegal to add crosswalks. Um, in a lot of locations. So it's a, it's a real catch-22 we put people in. It's very unjust. And I, there is a campaign going on that will hopefully reform um, the MUTCD and that, that provision especially. And thank you, Angie, for that um, and for bringing that up because I know that's something that uh, definitely affects us over here in California. So thank you to you and America Walks for working on the MUTCD uh, manual. I just wanted to say, I just wanted to add to, 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 the, to the conversation in terms of infrastructure. The reason why I think infrastructure is so important and really defines, you know, if and or where people are going to walk or jaywalk um, is because when I think of the road, it's how it's built really is based on how it's built is how folks will respond. So it's like the, you know, literally the built environment is it's like a map, <laughs> like a live map. Like, can I go here? Can I go there? Can I not? Okay, right? And so if if the built environment is telling you you have to do this or you have to do that, but then that's not really making sense with, with what we, and you know, an example that we share a lot is like, let's say you really have to cross the street to reach your church, your grocery store, your school in a particular way. And that's actually really what you need, but the road isn't really allowing you to, um, then, then that's really, really the problem, a, a big problem. And that's really why we need to make infrastructure make sense for people who walk, bike and roll, not just folks who drive. Now, many people would say, hey, it's easy to pick on designers, you know, engineers, planners, et cetera. Uh, Angie, let's go to your former profession, uh, media uh, delegate, hope your policymaker in many respects. Um, and we've already touched on law enforcement. The question from Lisa is, do you think we need to shift how reporters, policymakers, and police department uh, documents, document crashes involving pedestrians by not blaming the pedestrian in the description. You know, there's a lot of victim blaming. What role do you think that plays in this conversation around jaywalking or the need to decriminalize jaywalking? 
Um, I'll jump in there. That's a really good question. And I, one thing I'm sort of hopeful about is if we can um, decriminalize jaywalking or at least sort of de-escalate it as sort of the, it, it, it sort of prevents us from addressing the systemic causes of this problem. If we can just, every time someone is killed, just say, oh, well, it was sort of their fault too, too bad. And that's what we're doing right now. Uh, there's two, you know, uh, when you talk about the media, there may, there, there may be a paragraph or two in the newspaper, they say they're outside a crosswalk and that's it. Nobody, nobody loses any sleep over it. And um, I, I, so I think that if we can reframe, I think decriminalizing jaywalking would contribute to a reframing that would lead to a safer system and the kind of, kind of cities and neighborhoods that we sort of want. And if if I could jump in too, I think that the way that it, the conversation is kind of proceeded here in Kansas City is that it's it's that reframing is also about rethinking about the the broader things that we need to consider when we're wanting to bring in people who may see walking and biking as a, a kind of a luxury or kind of just an exercise activity. When we think about this, and I think Charles, you've done research on this as well we find that people aren't just concerned about the lack of infrastructure, that is important, but what's also important are, am I gonna be able to get safely from this place um, without having to worry about having to interact with police? And so thinking about things like jaywalking is, is one of the ways that we can begin to think more holistically about how we build that equitable transportation system that really is more usable for more of the people who, who really deserve to have access to those resources. Yeah, and, and the only thing that, that I would say is policymakers need to re help reframe that argument by decriminalizing it in the first place. That's, that's, the, that's the first step. I, I think we can all agree, at least I hope that we can, is that jaywalking is safe and that the, the people that do it don't do it to disrupt traffic. They do it because it's the safest place to cross to get to where they want to go. And again, I get this question over and over with, with, with my new law, I get it from the press. A lot of press try to, try to uh, push me into a corner on this by saying, you're gonna see now everyone jaywalk and now uh, you're gonna disrupt traffic. Again, I don't think a single person this, because of our law change is gonna jaywalk today that didn't jaywalk before. We're just now changing the conversation, and we've got to be able to make sure that we, we stay on top of that because jaywalking is safe. I do it all the time. The bottom line is we're trying to stop these interactions with law enforcement for, for people of color, which escalate in too, in too many situations for something as minor as this. If I can just add to that, too. Um because that really is a really good question. That's something that one of our partners actually brought up to me saying, hey, would you know California Walks maybe consider putting together a quick maybe resource guide to share with, in this case, it was with media about how to report on crashes involving uh, you know, pedestrians and people who, who bike. And I thought, yes, we totally need to do that. Um, because if I could also just add um, in, in our work across the state, we sometimes hear things that just to be really honest is really, really heartbreaking for me. Like certain city staff will say, yeah, we had a hit and run and the, you know, the person died, but you know, they were homeless. So that's, you know, like that's their fault. And I'm just, and, you know, and, you know, sometimes I'm so taken aback by the hurtful things. Sometimes people say that they don't realize is hurtful. And then I'm just like, you know, like, whoa, did you really just say that? And then, you know, you're like, try to come back to, to try to steer it like, well, you know, it's, it, it's not their fault though, you know, like, right. So all that to say that, yes, we definitely need to move away um, from victim blaming in, in every single layer, like elected officials, reporters, and even city staff. You have many people here listening in who would say, listen, we agree with you. 
we're on your side. We believe that it's important to decriminalize jaywalking. So please share with us your playbook. Michael, you know, Kansas City, you know, two Super Bowls, hit one, one, lost another one. You know, if there's a playbook here to help people affect policy uh, changes around jaywalking in their city, in their state, in their community, please share a little of your playbook with them. Let's start with you, um, Angie. Uh, good question. So one of the one of the reasons I want to do this was to sort of build support. I think it, it, you know I, I think this seemed like a really radical idea a few years ago. It was sort of on my radar probably about five years ago. That someone proposed this in Seattle and it never went anywhere. And now I think all of a sudden because of the work activists have been doing in the streets, elevating um, these policing issues, all of a sudden it does seem to be gaining a lot of speed. So I think like as planners, researchers, I, you know, my, I'm just trying to support um, the best I can with research and try to ease people's fears about safety. Now, one thing I just want to real quickly respond to Pat, uh, Delegate Hope's point as I don't think jaywalking is safe, but neither is crossing in a crosswalk. So right now there's no guarantee of safety for pedestrians, no matter where they cross. A lot, about a quarter of pedestrians who are killed are struck in the crosswalk. So there's nothing really that magical about being in the crosswalk. And that was always sort of a pretend thing like, oh, you're safe if you're in the crosswalk. That's not really true. Uh, the, you know, there's risk, there's risk in a lot of different situations. So you are, are you saying or implying that pedestrians aren't safe anywhere they walk? Yes. <laughs> yes. If you look at the actual situations where pedestrians are struck, it's just such a wide range of things. Kids playing in the street, um, people, you know, get struck a lot on highways when their cars are disabled. Those are counted as pedestrian deaths. People get, people get killed in parking lots. People get killed walking on the sidewalk with surprising frequency. People, you know, go through a driveway and hit someone who's standing right there on the sidewalk or veer off the road and hit someone who's standing at a bus stop. So pedestrians really aren't safe in too many places in the United States. There's no guarantee if they follow the rules, they're gonna be safe. Even the rule abiding pedestrians are being killed a lot in the United States right now. Okay, then, so I'm on your side, team. Give me the playbook. What can I do in my city, my state, and my community to change the jaywalking laws? So I think part of it is, is about kind of telling the story. So I think, um, part of what we've been doing here in Kansas City is, is working to demonstrate with qualitative evidence, you know, this is negatively impacting people. We've been fortunate to um, receive support from a number of organizations, including uh, the Midwest Innocence Project, who have said, you know, jaywalking is kind of the, the first step in the revolving door that leads to a life of, um, of being punished for things that were largely out of their control. And so I think taking that narrative and, and explaining to folks, you know, if we believe that um, we should not only be making our streets safer, if we believe that um, people deserve second chances and shouldn't be punished for things that are out of their control, this is, this is the low hanging fruit or low hanging stop sign, I guess, since we're in traffic um, jargon. But my, my point is that the, it, it very much depends on telling the story and convincing your your electeds and your planners to believe that this is something that is not only easy to do, but will lead to much more of the broader changes that we all believe are important to make a better transportation system for everyone. And, and you know, I would just say from Virginia's perspective, I mean, we started out with a single goal is, is to take a look at our, our traffic code and eliminate unnecessary interactions with law enforcement. And I think that's a conversation that localities and states are having right now. And I would suggest that they look to Virginia and, and, and to do that, whether it's just jaywalking or it's other parts of their traffic code, if they share the same goal to eliminate unnecessary interactions with law enforcement, I would suggest that they start with jaywalking. 
And I'm not sure that I'm fully equipped to answer this question for California because um, the folks who really started the efforts here were Cal Bike, so Jared. Um, but I do think that they did just what a delegate Hope just said, which was taking taking a step back and thinking through where where are the areas in which we can remove track traffic, sorry, traffic enforcement especially uh, and then especially analyzing some of that data which we do have as I shared out around how it's affecting in particular black Californians and those those type of you know and then all the consequences that that come from that um if I could add one more thing really quick to Charles um like one of the thing that we did when we were looking at this was um, kind of considering, you know, who had gone before. So Angie had mentioned Seattle. We had also looked at um, uh, Minneapolis where they had actually struck a couple of their laws that had led to over policing of people who were biking, things like loitering laws, anti-spitting laws. And that was also kind of something that we were able to, to use another city's example to say, Another city has done this. It's not exactly what we've done, but there is a format for us to be able to say it's not, Kansas City is not just in the lurch trying to do this on our own. There are other places that we can kind of take the lead from and modify and make it better and make it work for our community. Now, I've been fortunate enough to travel all over the US. I spent many, much time, a lot of time on the West Coast. Of course, I'm, on, I'm in the Northeast right now and I'm from the down South. There were, let's go back to California or the West Coast for a second. There will be many who will say, this is just another attempt by states like California, places like Seattle, these very liberal places to simply decriminalize every action possible. What's your response or reaction to that? Did I start? <laughs> uh, my gut feeling is <laughs> that um, no matter what, uh, people are going to, well, I'm noticing this in some of our other policy positions. Um, you can't make everyone happy and people will attack you. If they feel like they are somehow somehow if decriminalizing jaywalking is somehow taking away someone's power in some type of way and if that's how they perceive it then someone's going to be upset and in this instance i would say that it's taking away some power from drivers because we're really saying again the road is is for everyone <laughs> i don't know that i'm really answering your question other than you know, you you take you 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 acknowledge it and and you say thank you and I'm going to to move forward. This isn't just a liberal California West Coast uh, policy. This is something that <laughs> Michael has a lot to say about. Clearly, uh, this is something that that needs to get done across the country. And Michael, if you want to let's add let's, let's take the pressure off of California for a second. I do want to go to Ohio. And I want to go to Virginia as well. Many would say that you all, Michael, you included, you're representing these large cities, you know, the urban core, where you have these progressive policies that you're pushing. What are your responses, each of you, uh, in regards to those statements that you're simply aiming to decriminalize every activity associated to mankind? Well, if you want me to start, I, I certainly will. Uh, I, as I said earlier, when, when we brought this bill, I didn't hear a peep from law enforcement, and still to this day, I've not heard a peep from law enforcement about jaywalking. I, I've watched a lot of TV, a lot of Law and & Order and other criminal shows, and not once have they sat around the precinct saying, we've got to enforce these jaywalking laws. And this is smart policing. You know, police want to solve really important uh, felonies and, and other high uh, misdemeanors and things like that. This is not something that they that they're looking to do. They're not looking to enforce this law, uh, but we do see them use it disproportionately to people of color. And that was the goal and purpose there. But this smart policing gives them an opportunity to focus on other things and more serious crimes. And that's where they probably should be focusing anyway. 
And if the police won't do it, then we've got to change the laws. We've probably overregulated. We've written too many laws in this area, and that forces their hand. They have to enforce it. When you write a law and make something illegal, the enforcers have to enforce it. And so I think we're right-sizing police. We're being smarter with how we, we put out our law enforcement and what we want them to focus on. And so that's how I view this as a smarter way to police. Uh, <laughs> real quickly, um, sorry. I, I, you know, uh, I, I'm not very optimistic about this going forward in Ohio at the state level at least, but um, I know that they're looking at it in Texas and I guess it's in response to, and it actually passed out of committee. Um, I guess it's in response to this poor guy was walking home from his job at Walmart um, during their deep freeze and ended up being arrested and having to spend the night in jail over this. So I think that got some people's attention, but also I think like, you know, we talk about freedom and, um, you know, I think, you know, li libertarian ideology. I think it's very Orwellian actually that the, the level of social control sort of involved in this regulation, like you can be arrested and thrown in jail for walking wrong. Like, I think it, you know, sort of on a, just, um, an instinctual level, this something about it is a little bit off. So I'll, I'll, I can make it even simpler than that. Jaywalking laws don't work. So the idea, the whole idea with jaywalking laws is that they are supposed to make pedestrians safer. They've been on the laws for decades and they have clearly not worked. The, the, the majority of crashes that we have seen have begun to involve pedestrians and cyclists more and that has only increased. In Missouri, for example, 2020 was the deadliest year for pedestrians. There were 126 pedestrians on our streets who lost their lives and jaywalking laws did not do jack squat to prevent that from happening. So with the idea that this is some sort of liberal policy that we're pushing just to be progressive in all of this. We're pushing this because we want to save people's lives. Like it's, it's, it really is that simple that jaywalking laws have had their opportunity. They've had their chance to prove that they are a, they are a part of our arsenal that can help to make our streets safer and they haven't done the job. And so if you, if, if people want to make it um, conservative, it's like, if you, you gave it a chance, it didn't work. You need to get rid of it. Jaywalking's had its chance. It's had its chance for a long time and it hasn't worked. And this is us saying it doesn't deserve to keep having a chance to fail people, um, especially our most vulnerable. So all of you have spoken about the fact that people of color and low income people are disproportionately you know, targeted for jaywalking. Let's talk about restorative justice. Knowing this impact of jaywalking on communities of color, what does restorative justice look like to you? What would restorative justice look like? For me personally, I want reparations. I want checks written. I also want a reparation infrastructure package in communities of color from bicycle, pedestrian infrastructure, et cetera. Uh, but cash is certainly a big part of it. So what does restorative justice look like to you? Let's start with you, Michael. Let's go to Virginia, then California and Ohio. I think restorative justice means kind of to your point, kind of dedicated funding to specifically support the portions of our community that have suffered the most. So when, when we put um, traffic crash data overlay on, on Kansas City, if you put um, instances of asthma, if you put poor health outcomes in general, and almost always falls on the east side of our city, east of Troost. And while we have had some economic development investments in the past, I think that restorative justice would mean dedicated funding to specifically support those census tracts, those communities that have bore the brunt of not just our um, overemphasis on enforcement, but our underinvestment in infrastructure. And much to the um, chagrin of, of other folks, that's, that's really what we need um, on some level um, to really begin to make some of the repairs that we know are necessary to make uh, not just Kansas City, but the rest of our country better. And, and from Virginia's perspective, I mean, I, I agree with what Michael just said. 
uh, we have this year uh, legalized marijuana. And it's not unrelated to jaywalking because as I said, jaywalking is used as a pretext to stop someone and to search someone. And you could say you could search with the odor of marijuana and that's your opportunity to search their person uh, or to search their belongings. And so by, by decriminalizing jaywalking, but also legalizing marijuana, you're going to see bring us in the state about $300 million annually by legalizing marijuana that is going to be directly sent in, in for most of it going towards communities that have been over policed for marijuana and would probably be over policed for jaywalking for black and brown people because the two are linked. And so you're going to see a lot more monies going in this area. The other part is that we're going to open up our, our infrastructure when we start a regulatory infrastructure, when we start selling marijuana that gives communities of color the opportunity to own a piece of it, to own the part of the retail or the growing or the manufacturing, all that that's involved in it, because there's a lot of money to be made here. And so when you talk about reparations, not only from the taxes are going to communities of color, but also the opportunities to own a piece of the business as well, too. And that's how we're dealing with reparations in this regard. Um, first of all, I love this question. <laughs> when I think about restorative justice, I think about healing, about healing wounds. And, and, and so, how, you know, how does that align with what, what we're talking about now? One of the ways in which I've tried to talk about complete streets is also making it about belonging. It's about knowing that I belong on the street, that I'm safe on the street, that I can cross, that I can cross where I need to cross, that in this instance, you know, law enforcement isn't going to look at me a certain way or or, or judge me for, for the color of my skin. And so I think that so tying that back, restorative justice and healing and belonging to this work, that's, that is very much about infrastructure and taking what we here at California Walks have also called a reparations approach to um, infrastructure, which we probably don't really use that word reparations very publicly because I wanna acknowledge that that I'm not black and other folks on our team aren't black. So I wanna acknowledge that I think that's something that should be should be led by, you know, by black folks, black Californians. But I will say just to kind of echo what, what you were saying, um, Michael, um, our approach is this is why you now with the infrastructure funding that we do have, that's why now we're going, we need to go prioritize all of those communities that were intentionally redlined, that were intentionally, you know, cut with all kinds of freeways, especially here in Southern California, right? So, so, so putting those communities and those people first. Um, I think that's all I have to say for now. I, I think I, I had more to say, but I think that's it for now. So the only thing I would add is um, in that in that interesting Jacksonville study that I mentioned earlier, they talked about the impacts that being cited for jaywalking had on people. And that what can happen is so often it's very low income people who are cited and the, the um, fines weren't very big. I think they were about $60. But for very low income people, it, it often, um, they ended up in this trap where they couldn't pay it. Um, so then they're, they're in this escalating, escalating penalties where maybe they're losing a license. Maybe they're ending up in jail over, or something like that. So many, many people um, after they, they went back years later had not sort of resolved. It hadn't been adjudicated. It hadn't been paid for this very minor Fine. So I do think um, like some of this legislation, and I know that this has been done with marijuana legislation, legalization in some places, well, we should wipe the slate clean for the people at minimum. I mean, that's not, that's not even restorative justice, but that's just justice. You know, they should not be still in this sort of legal quagmire over um, this meaningless infraction. Thank you. I have about two more questions, then we'll wrap up here. This next question, I haven't heard you uh, 
you all touch on this topic yet, uh, which is a connection I see through jaywalking and gender-based violence and or crime in general. Many of the communities I've been in, people have decided to cross the street outside of a crosswalk because near that crosswalk may have been men or a group of persons that they were simply trying to avoid. And we know how women and other sexual minorities are disproportionately targeted by not only by just police officers, but also members of their communities. So can you speak to the need as to why, to Delegate Hope's point, it's important to see jaywalking as people's attempt to simply be safe or safer, I should say, because they're, they are attempting to avoid places that they know uh, could cause harm to their persons. So please touch on, if you can, anyone, potentially the connection between crime, gender-based violence, and jaywalking. So I can I can start on this and and I'll I'll cite a, a local case that is actually still working its way through the court. There was a um, trans woman by the name of Brianna Hill who was accosted by uh, two police officers on a sidewalk. Um, she received very serious injuries and had to be hospitalized, and um, she ultimately pushed for charges. She's no longer with us. She was she was murdered, but. Um, I think that the, the intersection there is that, you know, we, we really do need to, need to consider again that kind of juxtaposition that I think Delegate Hope and Angie were kind of speaking to and how we consider safety in the context of mobility. And the idea that it is not just about trying to kind of access something, but to um, avoid um, gaining something else. And I think that, especially when we think about it in Kansas City, we, we really unfortunately have that, that local example of a woman who, who just wanted to feel safe and who, who had the right to expect to feel safe in the context of who we consider people of authority. And she wasn't able to be afforded that. And so if, if we believe that that is how we should be organizing our streets, then we can't have situations where something like that happens and no one is held accountable. All right, thank you. So the big question, the question of all questions, where do we go from here? I would like to offer you each, you know, uh, a few minutes to kind of talk through next steps and where do we go from here to close out the session? Um, we can start with whoever is ready to, to kind of offer that position, but where do we go from here? Well, I hope people don't get tired of me uh, talking too much, but, um, I, I think our thoughts here in Kansas city are that we, we want to see this adopted and, and we're going to continue pushing for this legislation. Um, but we hope that it can be a catalyst. You know, we Bike Walk KC works specifically in Kansas City, Missouri, but we work as part of a region that includes two states, um, eight counties, and, and over 100 municipalities. So our, our hope is that we're not just able to um, get something and kind of, you know, say, rah, rah, we did it, but we want to create an example. Where we go from here is we use this as a means of saying, you know, this is what this can look like. And this is what this can look like in Kansas City, Kansas. This is what it can look like in some of our suburbs. This is what it can look like even in some of our rural um, stretches of, of our broader region. So we really do want to be able to take this and use this as a template to encourage other communities to take that important step to decriminalize uh, the act of jaywalking and create a safer, built environment for their most vulnerable road users. I'll go next. Uh, here in California, the bill is AB 1238. It just passed the Assembly Transportation Committee last Monday, I think. Time, oh my God. Um, it just passed last week and it will be moving 
into another committee. Um, I don't have an update yet as to when it will be heard and will be voted on in that committee. I, I don't know that, I don't know if anyone else does in California, but all that to say that it sort of, you know, it passed its first hurdle. We had a support letter that had like, I don't know, 88 sign-ons. So it was, it was incredible. And, and I just really need to say this again, if I didn't already, uh, that this was, has, was really a collaborative effort uh, between Cal Bike, us, Cal Walks, LA Walks, and the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights of the San Francisco Bay Area. And to also, you know, answer your, your question about where, where, like, kind of where do we go from here? Um, I think for us, it really is having that long, larger and longer conversation about police enforcement and enforcement and law enforcement in traffic and traffic stops. And I, I feel like this is really just the beginning of that. Um, and I'm very much looking forward to that. So thank you. Yeah, and, and I'm I'm glad to follow up uh, just from from my perspective and what we've learned. I mean, it it does seem like this is a movement that's gaining momentum, and uh, and I was glad that Virginia is is on the cutting edge of of doing this. But these conversations and and you know taking advantage of the of the moment that we're in. I mean, I I do think that and I say this frequently in different talks that I go to. We're in the middle of history being made right now. It's hard to, to imagine this, what, what we've been through over the last year, year and a half or so, has propelled policymakers, lawmakers like me, to rethink how we do police, rethink how we do criminal justice. I mean, Angie mentioned we passed a law for expungement of, of all, all marijuana offenses for, for simple possession of marijuana, but other crimes as well, too. And so we're in the middle of history being made and it's hard to understand that when you're just looking at this bill by bill law by law or day by day but something is happening in this country and policymakers want to get it right and i think these conversations are happening all over the country so this movement is starting to gain momentum specifically as it relates to jaywalking i would challenge and ask every law enforcement officer or policymaker in localities and, and states thinking about this, does enforcing jaywalking make your community safer? And, and I think that the overwhelming answer to that is no. Enforcement is not making yourself safer, of jaywalking safer. So I just hope people look at that, ask those questions, and I think that, that more and more localities will come down that we should decriminalize jaywalking. And it's really important to have these conversations right now because it's really been ingrained in our systems that the, the, the cars, the vehicles have the right of way. And if the pedestrians get hit, well, they, they shouldn't have been crossing in the first place. And so we got to start getting out of that mentality. And I think passing these laws across the country is the first step. Angie? Um, I don't know if I have a lot to add to that, but uh, I do think if it could, we could see this pass in California, 50 million people live in California. I, I think it would be really huge. Um, and I do think it will set a good example. And then there is also to think about some of these bike, these broken windows policing applies to cycling rules too. We should look at that. It applies to transit users as well. We're getting people every, every, every way they move. You know, obviously there's been a lot of attention on driving, but there was broken windows policing for bicyclists, which we saw recently in New Jersey. Um, that horrible viral video out of Perth Amboy, I might be pronouncing that wrong. Um, and also in people have been talking about, I know there's a lot of discussion about it for transit um, in California um, with the fare evasion and that kind of thing. So uh, I, I am sort of hopeful about what we see going on right now and I'm rooting for California and all these places. So it sounds to me, Angie, like you just said, they, they have arrested people's mobility. Okay. In, in, in closing, um, Commissioner, starting with Angie, then going to Michael, uh, then Cairo, right? Then um, uh, Delegate Hope, 
how can the people reach you, find you, stay connected to you? Angie? Yeah, I actually did want to mention, um, uh, if I can be a resource, I'm trying to help in California, there's only so much I can do, but I also might be able to refer people to resources. Um, you can reach me, uh, Angie, at 3mphplanning.com is my email. If you do want to reach out, I'll put it in the chat. Michael? Yeah, um, I'm always happy to talk with um, advocates on the ground who want to see if they can get this going in, in their own communities. Um, I'll put my name in the chat um, or my email in the chat. But uh, yeah, follow me on, on uh, Twitter and, and check out our organization's website, bikewallkc.org. Yeah, so we at California Walks, we have, um, we have an Instagram that where we've been adding a lot of a lot of videos so you can follow us on instagram california walk and then we also have a twitter that's where we primarily uh, post mainly our policy our policy work and i and i believe our twitter handle is just at cal yeah at california walk and i will add our website and my uh, email on the chat as well And, and if you need to reach me, I mean, I'm glad to share with you model legislation that we used in Virginia. Uh, go to my website. It's uh, hopeforvirginia.org. Uh, That's H-O-P-E-4, F-O-R, Virginia, B-I-R-G-I-N-A, all spelled out, hopeforvirginia.org. Glad to share with you our legislation that you can talk to your legislators, tell them what we're doing in, in other parts and, um, and, and see if there's interest in, in bills getting introduced. But let's face it. It's not gonna. It's not gonna do anything. It's not gonna pass unless you ask, and so we need people to 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 make the ask, organize and make the ask. I would like to thank each and every one of you for being here today. You are an amazing group of panelists. I want to thank my co-moderator John, uh, as well as Jared. In terms of following me, you can follow me at hashtag Arrested Mobility. Thank you. This has been a great go. national. Also want to make sure we want to thank you as well for moderating this discussion. It was seen more like a conversation than a panel discussion. So really thank you for the awesome questions and the moderation. Thank you, John. You're so and kind. we also have notes from the meeting, so we'll be sure to share that as well uh, to you all. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone, uh, please drive, walk, bike, transit safely. Uh, it's been a pleasure. And with that, we're going to um, move things to a close. Thank you. Thanks everyone.